Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are now ready for the next presentation, and the next company is, uh, is Claria Pharma. Uh, we will hear a presentation by the CEO, Jesper Wiklund. Jesper, take it away. Thanks, Mikael. So, uh, thank you. Claria is a drug delivery company. We are listed on the Stockholm First North NASDAQ. We did our IPO in 2016, and since then, we're listed on the NASDAQ First North. So, uh, we have a drug delivery technology, which when used correctly, adds a lot of value to the uh, molecules and to the patients that we're treating. And um, spend a couple of minutes first just explaining how it works, because that's sort of key to how we choose our programs and what we're trying to do as a company. So, what we have, we have a film. It's a small film. It's uh, uh, the size of a small stamp. And this film, you put it into your mouth, you put it into, on the inside of the cheek, onto the oral mucosa. And most people are aware that pretty much nothing sticks to the oral mucosa. And that also makes sense if you think about it, because kind of the purpose or one of the key purposes of the, of the oral mucosa on the mouth is to make sure that nothing sticks there, but it actually goes into the stomach. Well, our film does stick. So if you put it on the, the mucosa, it immediately attaches to the mucosa, and then it sits there. It sits there for five minutes. We can make it sit longer, but typically five minutes is enough time. And then during that time, whatever drug that we've loaded into the film transfers from the film across the mucosa and directly into the blood. So, to differentiate this from other oral films or dissolvable tablets or oils or whatever else that you're supposed to put into your mouth, uh, uh, what does not happen with our film, but what happens with all of these other technologies, what does not happen with our film is that it melts quickly and mixes with the saliva. And anything that sort of melts in your mouth and mixes with the saliva, you swallow. Again, this does not happen. So we can actually put something into the mouth and bypass the stomach. We go directly from the film across the mucosa into the blood. This is a, for anybody who is uh, sort of well-versed in drug delivery through the mucosa in the oral cavity, they know that this is a very, very big claim. A lot of people have tried to do this, but very few people or basically nobody can do it. Uh, until we are now doing this. And so as a proof of the fact that we actually do what we say we do is that we are in fact focused on drugs that are not orally available or for other reasons cannot be given orally and actually have to be injected or given as a nasal spray. And so if you think about our strategy, and again, I think our strategy here in this case is very important because if we choose with our strategy, the right programs and the right development programs, we can really add a lot of value to patients, to the healthcare system, and thereby also then create very valuable products, even though we are using a drug delivery system and not inventing a new molecule. Usually, especially these days, if you are really trying to create a lot of value, it's good to go with, with a new molecule, but again here, Here's what we're doing. So we ask ourselves two questions. The first question is, is the product today available only as an injectable or as a nasal spray? Yes or no? And if yes, you see here that you move, move over into the green area of the chart. And then the second question we ask ourselves is, does this present a problem? Because there are, of course, cases where an, giving an injection is not a problem. For example, if you're in a hospital bed, already on a drip, et cetera, that's not an issue. But if you're at home or if you're in another setting where either a injection or a nasal spray ends up being a bad solution, this is where we want to come in. And this is where we think that we can add a lot of value. And all of our programs fit into this matrix. So a few words on what those programs are. Our pipeline, um, the most advanced compound that we have, where we have now initiated, we are now in the middle of 
the pivotal, meaning required for registration, the pivotal bioequivalence study that we're running is with sumatriptan. Now, sumatriptan, some of you may be aware, is an acute treatment for a, for a migraine. I'll tell you more about this in a moment. We then also have epinephrine, naloxone, ketamine, and midazolam under the pharma envelope, and we are also using cannabis in the film. Epinephrine, naloxone, and ketamine are not at all orally available molecules. So again, if what I said previously of our drug actually, our film actually doing sort of what we say it do, it does, uh, if that were not to, to be the case, none of these programs would be affected. And uh, we know already from preclinical studies that they are. So in other words, this pretty big claim we're making that we in fact achieve transmucosal delivery in the oral cavity seems to be true. All right, uh, a few more words about the commercial pipeline. So if the commercial potential in our pipeline, so if we are successful in bringing these programs to market that we currently have in the pipeline, what's the expectation we can have in terms of the, uh, the market size of the products that we'll create? So first of all, with Sumatriptan, we believe that Sumatriptan on a, in Europe and in the United States can reach a peak sales potential of about $250 million a year at peak sales. Peak sales come in typically at around year five. Uh, the cannabis market, as many of you know, is an enormous market. It's a $24 billion market in the United States alone. We believe that we have a very interesting and differentiated product that can really make significant inroads into this cannabis market. I'll tell you very quickly about that in a moment. Naloxone is again, uh, uh, here we're, we're, we're trying to create a new market, which is um, co-prescription. This is something that everybody in the United States wants. Co-prescription of naloxone, which is a treatment against opioid overdose. So you prescribe that together with an opioid. This, if we're successful in doing this, is going to be an enormous market. It could be a billion dollar market, we'll see but it's certainly a very good market. Finally, I wanted to mention again, also adrenaline, the, the product that we're looking to displace with a superior technology in 2019 in the US alone did over $2 billion in sales. The message here I think is that if we're successful here, there's gonna be very big markets and uh, uh, very large commercially significant products for us. Cannabis delivery sciences, given that we don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna be quick here, but in principle today, if you wanna use or, or cannabis, you have two choices. You can smoke or you can eat. Smoking is by far, from a pharmacological point of view, is by far the best option. It's fast, it's efficient, uh, uh, but you know, smoking is dangerous. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's bad for, for your health. It is illegal almost everywhere. It's socially stigmatized. So smoking has a lot of problems, which is why people are now looking very closely at edibles. Edibles is basically anything, uh, any gummy bears or oils or, or, or any other kind of preparations that you take uh, that go into the stomach. The advantage here is you don't have to smoke. The disadvantage is the time to effect is very long and the bioavailability of cannabinoids taken to the stomach. In other words, the proportion of the drug that you actually put into your body that gets out into the blood, this is very low. So we have the best of both worlds with our technology. You put the film in, you get a quick effect and it's bioavailable, meaning a lot of what you put into yourself gets into the blood, so it's efficient. At the same time, of course, there's no smoking involved. So we really think, uh, given the right partners, and we're working very, very hard with close to one partnership already, we're working on more. Uh, we believe that this could be a very meaningful product in the cannabis space, which again, is a $24 billion market in the United States alone. But I'll leave that now. And in the time that I have left, I'm gonna focus on uh, our lead asset uh, only because given the fact that this is the lead asset, it's the driver of value in the near term. We can all see that this woman is in serious pain. Um, 
Migraine is a very serious disease. This is not a bad headache. Migraine is something that completely incapacitates people. You get a migraine and you're knocked out for 24 hours or maybe even 48 hours. By knocked out, I mean you're lying in your bed with the worst possible headache you can imagine. You're very often nauseous, throwing up. You are sensitive to light. So you're lying there in a dark room with the curtains drawn. You can't go to work. You cannot take care of your family. You cannot do anything that's associated with a normal life. So this is a disease that really puts people on their back and it's a very, very serious disease. Very importantly, and sort of the key to understanding our product is that 80% of the patients who suffer from migraine also suffer from so-called concomitant nausea, meaning that they throw up. They get nauseous and they throw up. Maybe not every single time that they get a migraine, although many do throw up every single time, but they do it often enough that it's a serious component of their disease. Now, why, why is that a problem? Well, that is a problem because if you take a tablet, you take a tablet with a glass of water, it goes into your stomach, it takes about 20 minutes for that tablet to dissolve and to start transferring into the, in, uh, into the blood, sometimes longer. If you throw up, you're emptying the contents of the stomach, including uh, the medicine you just took. So for 80% of people who suffer from migraine, taking a tablet is a very risky way and a very ineffective way to take your medicine. So what, what, what happens now? Well, people move to nasal sprays. The problem with nasal sprays is they're very variable in their delivery. And also, as anybody knows who has ever used a nasal preparation, what ha ends up happening is a lot of it falls down the back of your throat and then it goes back into the stomach. And again, then obviously, if you have uh, a nausea and you throw up, then you're back where you started. Now, this is important because imagine the scenario, it's, it's two o'clock in the morning, you wake up, you, 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 you know the telltale signs of here comes a migraine attack. You also know from experience that the sooner you treat this, the more likely it is that you can live a normal life the next day. You also know that 80% of the time or 80% of people know that they very often are nauseous. So what do people do? They wake up at two o'clock in the morning. They feel an attack is coming. They go to the bathroom. They take out a syringe. They draw medicine into the syringe and stick the syringe into their thigh or into their seat and inject it. And the reason they do this is because they know that if they do that, they're sure that the drug is delivered. The injectable preparation sold over uh, approximately $200 million a year last year. Now that's a massive amount of drug that's being sold. Now, again, imagine, I mean, the, 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 <laughs> what's involved with actually standing up and doing this and injecting yourself this is not something that anybody does unless they absolutely have to. Injections, people fear injections, they're, they're painful, et cetera. And it's exactly this functionality, the functionality of the injection that we want to replace with our film. So we believe that we're gonna be able, if we can show the bioequivalents here, we're gonna be able to replace a large part of the injection market, a large part of the nasal spray market. And we're also gonna be able to convert many of the people, because this is sort of a, uh, a, 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 an evil cycle here. You know, people do the tablets, it doesn't work. You go in the nasal spray, you try the injections, you hate the injections. So then you go back to the tablets again. So we think that in all these three markets, uh, there's a significant room for us to come in and claim significant share. And it's because of this that we are very excited about this product. We think it's a good demonstration of what our technology can do. And we, um, we uh, think it's going to be a significant market. Um, quickly here, uh, we're running our study now. We, we're going to have data from the study in the first quarter of next year. And we're going to file also uh, according to our plans next year. If you have about a year's review period, this means that in the, in, in the not too distant future at all, 
2022, we can be in a, a position where this drug is approved and ready for launch. We're looking at various different options for how to commercialize this. Um, I think uh, one very important, and what we'll end with, one very important comparable transaction. About a year ago, a US-based specialty pharma company paid 70, 70, 70 million dollars up front for a sumatriptan pen and nasal spray. So this was nothing new. It was just sort of something hopefully, possibly better. This company paid 70 million bucks to acquire these products so that they could launch them. They'd just been approved so that they can launch them. What this shows to us is that obviously this company, and we think many others, given that nobody pays 70 million up front unless there's competition, many people judge that there's still a lot of medical space, uh, medical need here, and there's a lot of space to make money with some trip down. So we're actually very excited about this product. Uh, we have more uh, slides, we have more products. I'm quite aware of the fact that we're uh, running out of time. So I will just say that both naloxone and also adrenaline are uh, epinephrine are, if we manage to bring these products to market, we have very, very large markets and we're gonna have a superior product because in both places, we're, we're replacing either a nasal spray or an injectable pen. These are old technologies that are very poorly suited for purpose and our new uh, and, and specifically designed for these, for these indications, technology and films would be so much better and can be sold at the same price or even less, uh, given that we have much more attractive cost of goods. So uh, I think I'll leave it there. And then we have um, some time left over for, uh, for uh, uh, questions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jesper. Um, you um, you mentioned uh, you, you have a you have a study ongoing in uh, sumatriptan, uh, yes. and uh, you announced earlier this week that you had the first patient first visit. Uh, right. So, can you elaborate a little bit on this study? How how many patients? How long will the recruitment take? In your expectation, I guess the follow up is uh, counted in hours in this, uh, since this is uh, uh, bioequivalence. But how mm -hmm. long before you know the outcome? Do you think? Well, so we've said that we 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 expect to have the data. Uh, obviously, not the, the final report, but we expect to have data from this study in the first quarter of next year. That was the expectation that we had all along. We experienced a slight delay in the approval of the product, uh, in approval of the study. Uh, and this was because our plan was based on uh, sort of our experience of what typical timelines are. It turned out that the uh, regulatory authorities in the UK, the MHRA, they ended up using the maximum time allotted to themselves, uh, uh, which we did not think they were going to do. We had conversations with them about that. That was because of the fact that uh, basically with Corona, they're very sort of overloaded. So uh, despite the fact that we're sort of three weeks behind our initial schedule, we still believe that we're going to be able to report data in the beginning or in, uh, in the first quarter of next year. We'll see. We're including 35, we're having 35 screening visits this week. So we're pushing forward hmm. with, uh, with a very high pace to try to make that timeline. And it's a bioprovalence study, as you mentioned, of, uh, which is, again, the pivotal study that is required for uh, for approval. Mm. And uh, you also are planning for a couple of more studies to start next year, as you showed in, the, in the, your chart. Um, I think uh, the most uh, the most relevant ones are probably naloxone and uh, adrenaline. Uh, yes. th those are dose finding studies that you uh, intend to start yes. next year. Um, yes. Do you have any ideas on the timeline for those two? <laughs> Sure, uh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we think, so we're now, and this is something that's not to be underestimated, we started the clinical uh, program, we're now manufacturing clinical material. Uh, this is not without its challenges and it's also, you know, takes quite a bit of time. So we expect to be able to start the, uh, the dose finding studies in um, next year in both of these programs. Then, you know, uh, given a positive outcome of those studies, we can then move on and do the bioequivalent studies in between then, in between those two studies. Again, there'll be a manufacturing step of the dose then that we find to be the appropriate one. 
So if we say that in 2021, we'll be doing the clinical uh, dose finding, those do not take a very long time. So we'll probably be able to start manufacturing as well in, uh, in 2021. Then in 2022, we will do the uh, bioequivalence studies. We'll have the results of those hopefully then by the end of 2022, meaning that in 2023, uh, you know, given a, a good pace, we would be in a position where we can consider filing most of these products. All right. So, so your plan is to uh, to take them through both dose finding and bioequivalence study before you go looking for license partners for these uh, these um, products. Um, let me. Yeah, I think our strategy is to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and. I think for both of these programs, in particular for the adrenaline, I mean, epinephrine, EpiPen, as I said, is a $2 billion a year molecule, mm. right? And everybody understands this. And you, it, it, it's very quick to understand that a film that, that looks like this, that you just pop into your mouth, mm. is just so much better than an auto-injectable pen that you have to give to a child and shove it into their thigh and inject it. I mean, that's just, this is, a, this is just such a superior technology that we already have, and we've actually publicly said this, so I'm not saying something new, we have had companies approaching us, being very interested in this program. They know that we're doing this. They're very surprised that we can actually put adrenaline, epinephrine into a film and have it work. Mm. At first they don't believe it, but then they look at our data and they say, wow, this is really interesting. So I believe that, you know, it's we're always evaluating everything. You know, it's possible that we can do something from a business development point of view, from a licensing point of view, earlier than the full sort of uh, package mm. on, on the epinephrine. But, you know, I'd rather not promise something and, and then uh, and then uh, surprise people rather than go out here and promise something now. But uh, this is a very, very interesting program. Mm. And finally, sure. just very shortly, I know that you have yeah. some intellectual property also in the um, in the area of uh, vaccination and yes. uh, I think everybody yes. can imagine that uh, just uh, giving uh, taking a, a small oral film instead of having a shot uh, when you yeah. need to do mass yeah. vaccinations that could be huge are, yeah. you, are you currently working on this we are I mean we you know we we, we said uh, at the very beginning of the year when, when corona got a big deal we said you know how are they going to inject billions of people, especially with vaccines that need to be kept at a very low temperature. So you can imagine, I mean, if theoretically something like this, if you can get it stable, you could send it out in the post. You can send a film like this to every household uh, in the mail hmm. and just have it pop into their mouth. So this is, we're a long way away from there. I don't want to promise or say that we're there. I will say that we're working on it. We see the potential for this for a corona vaccine potentially but also for many other vaccines, and, and, and in particular for vaccines that have to be given in developing countries. For example, in Africa, if you could do something like this, as opposed to an injection, even if it's a smaller vaccine, I mean, that could be of a tremendous benefit. So Great. that's kind of a skunk works thing we're working on. We're not talking too much about it, but yeah, it's, it's something that could be very interesting. Absolutely. Great. Thanks very much, Jesper. Thank you. Thanks, Alf. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And we have a very short break, and uh, next uh, next uh, company to, come, uh, to enter the stage is Hansa Biopharma. <laughs> 